These are the insane origins of modern technology. Number one, messaging. Starting from the very beginning, around 70,000 years ago, someone scratched a rock on a cave and thought it looked like a stick. So then drawings were born, and people could message their relatives just like in the crudes where Grug tells his family stories about some dude dying. When societies grew bigger, they made drawings to represent currency, and then evolved into writing. Mail would eventually be created to message people, but the skill was reserved to small groups recording taxes ew, and historical events. Messaging from a distance was limited to smoke signals and were used for specific reasons like invasions. Egypt made the first mail system around 2400 BC, where messengers ran and delivered scrolls for the pharaoh, sort of like real life DMs. This was pretty dope because it laid the foundation of the mailing service and hence messaging from afar. Later on, people noticed that a breed of pigeons would always return to where they were raised. In 1350 BC, they used pigeons to send messages across the Nile River. Horseback riding with mail was also a common practice for royal messaging like in ancient Iran. Essentially, most of the mail was reserved for the rich and powerful during this time period, or the equivalent of someone owning 30 bitcoins. Man, I should have invested in Dogecoin. Jumping 2500 years later, now even a peasant could send mail in Britain. However, mail in these times were notoriously slow. Depending how far your mail buddy is, it could take a day or even months to reach them. So what if it was urgent news and you needed to notify them now? Well back then, your news really would be late. You see, a man named Samuel Morse had gone away on a work trip. He was a successful painter that took on commissions from wealthy families and politicians. He got to work on creating a wonderful piece of art until a letter was sent to him. It was about his wife. She was sick, fatally sick. He dropped the commission and headed back to see her, but the moment he had returned, she had already been buried. This terribly broke his heart, and rightfully so. So he set his mind to make messaging faster than it ever was before. But how? He was on a boat returning from Europe and overheard a man speaking about this thing called electromagnetism. He engaged in a conversation with them and found that electricity could travel through wire almost instantly, and that wrapping metal with copper could make it temporarily magnetic. So he got a bright idea. What if he could send a message through wires of electricity? He made a button that completed a circuit when pressed, then the current would travel through a copper wire, which turned on a temporary magnet to create a dot or dash. Now with a bit of help from a physician and a machinist, he was able to create the official telegraph. The first message was sent from Washington DC to Baltimore in the US in 1844. The message said, what hath God wrought? If you're confused as I was on what this actually meant, it's a verse from the Bible and Moore sent this message to say he was gifted from God to make the invention. The receiving end of the telegraph would then have to decode the pulses into words and so Morse code was born. Then a man in Italy named Guglielmo Marconi was fascinated with electricity and curious about the telegraph. He wondered, could it be possible to make a device to message without wires? You see, even though it was amazing at the time, placing wires was slow and expensive, especially over mountains and across the ocean. There was also a huge problem with messaging ships. You can't simply put cables on them. So he researched and found a certain phenomenon that would occur with a spark of electricity. Discovered by Henry Hertz, an electric spark created three-dimensional waves in the air, sort of like throwing a pebble in an invisible lake. This wave is otherwise known as a radio wave. Now, the reason why this wave was so important is that it could affect an electrical circuit. Using a glass tube of iron filings, it would nearly complete a circuit, but once a spark was made near it, the wave would travel and move the filings together and electricity would flow. He experimented a lot to make the range better by using antennas in higher voltage, which then led to 1901 where Marconi and his new team transmitted the first wireless message across the Atlantic Ocean, which was more than 2,000 miles away, proving to all the doubters at the time it was actually possible to message across the globe wirelessly. Jumping to 1984, two men named Friedhelm and Bernard developed the technology of SMS. During this time, people could only call with their telephones or cell phones, but not message. This then led to the first text message being sent on a cell phone in 1992 on December 3rd. A 22-year-old test engineer named Neil Papworth was making sure his software would work correctly for a company. He sent the first text message in history that said, Merry Christmas to a coworker at a holiday party. But it was only for the company to alert customers information, so no texting back. Jumping a year later, Nokia released the first SMS featured phone and allowed texting back. Unfortunately, people didn't have the digital keyboard we know and love today. The old phones had a number pad instead of a keyboard, so for me to try to spell out the word Riz, I would have to type 7 3 times, then 4 3 times, then 9 4 times, and then the same thing again. This inconvenience gave birth to the message slang such as BRB and LOL, and they still exist today. 
In 1992, the first phone with the QWERTY keyboard was introduced and lives were much happier. However, there was a big elephant in the room, and a really ugly one too. Let's say you're using phone company Verizon on your phone and your friend is using AT&T. You weren't able to message them. Why? Well, because companies were competitive and their phone lines were constructed completely different from others. So what changed them to become connected? Well, mostly because the government was like, hey, make these networks compatible. It's like super inconvenient to switch plans and cancel. So then phone lines were forced to, well, make them compatible. Then in 1999, everybody was able to talk with each other regardless of what service they were using. Remember SMS? Well, in 2002, people used that foundation to send more than just a text message. See, this is when cameras were on phones, but you couldn't send it to your friend. Then boom, multimedia messaging service was born and an image, audio, or video could be sent. Then in 2007, the first iPhone was released with a multi-touchscreen keyboard, making it easier than ever to message people with just using your fingers. In 2025, these are the foundations that make messaging instantaneous and are nearly accessible to the entire world. And I really feel honored to be in a time that such a normal part of my life is the work of several centuries of innovation, just so friends can send the most offensive Instagram reels. Number 2. Flying. 5 months into 5 hours. That's how much time you save if you traveled with a horse and a wagon compared to a trip on an airplane non-stop. How did we get to the point where we are today? Somewhere from 400 and 200 BC, located in China, a farmer was going up against a harsh wind on the field. He had a string attached to his straw hat and saw that the wind made his hat fly. This is where the kite was invented. Kites were then designed to capture even more wind and rise higher, eventually used for military purposes like measuring distances for armies or secret intel. Jumping 18 centuries later, in 1485, a man named Leonardo da Vinci dreamed of having people fly just like birds. So he designed a device called the ornithopter, and marks the first design of making a man fly with a machine. Although he never built the machine, it wouldn't have worked either way due to the materials not being strong or light enough, and a lack of propulsion. However, later his design of the aerial screws was heavily inspired in modern flying technology such as helicopters and drones, which is pretty cool. Side note, flapping like a bird for flight would have never worked the way he envisioned it. The wings would have to be a football field long to work, and need a lot of power to flap the wings. Even with the technology today, it's just too inefficient. In 1709, a man noticed that hot air would make ashes rise from a fire. He thought to himself, what if he could use that hot air to make something or even someone fly? The Brazilian priest named Bartolomeu de Guzmão invented the idea of the first hot air balloon. He used the funds he requested from the king and court to create four successful tests of the balloon device. Yet the court did not trust the science behind it, and that it would likely cause a fire. Keep in mind, this is around the time when people thought witches were a huge deal back in the day, and your neighbor could be a witch or something. Most historians won't count this as the invention of the hot air balloon, because he did not fully fly the balloon. But I'm going to count it because he was basically cock-blocked by the court to keep innovating. Joseph Michael and Jack Etienne made the first official hot air balloon in France in 1783. You see, these guys had a family business with paper manufacturing, and were quite wealthy. Similarly to Bartolomeo, they discovered that fire would make stuff rise, like paper. So then they made a larger version and tested it out. After successfully flying it above the ground, they made a huge balloon that could carry people. They first tested it with a sheep, duck, and a rooster tethered by rope to see if it was safe. The first launch with actual people happened weeks later and it was two people that traveled 5 miles and 20 minutes in front of one of the Louis the Kings in a large crowd in Paris. People in the crowd were absolutely mesmerized by the fact that people can now touch the sky. Like you probably don't really understand this because we all, we just we see this all the time, but like, like literally people never saw this happen. It was like seeing somebody like teleport. I don't know. One of the unmanned balloons that was launched fell by a nearby village where a crowd attacked it with pitchforks because they thought it was dangerous, and I don't blame them. They never saw anything else fly except for birds, and the size would be as big as a house. Otto Leonthal was obsessed with the idea of flying like birds. He would spend all his hours on the ways birds flew and the shape of their wings. Then he realized that the wing of a bird had a curved shape to allow them to glide over the sky. So he began building gliders that would allow him to achieve the same result. In 1891, he successfully glided in Berlin, Germany, using the Derwitzer glider on a small hill. A structure that used willow rods and cotton fabric to glide 80 feet and navigate by shifting his body around. He had so much fun doing this that he flew more than 2,000 flights and averaged 9 seconds of gliding. So yeah, it wasn't like a lot, but still. He ended up making 16 different glider designs from his studies on aerodynamics. Then in 1896, he was gliding when a strong wind pushed against him, making him stall in the air and then he fell 50 feet. His buddies picked him up and took him to a doctor where he was paralyzed and unfortunately died from brain trauma. He did not die in vain however, his information and studies on aerodynamics were crucial for future flying. 
In 1896, American physicist Samuel Langley launched a steam-powered model glider, known as the Aerodrome No. 5. This 16-feet long aircraft powered by a small steam engine managed to fly for approximately 90 seconds over the Potomac River near Washington, D.C. Langley's experiments showed that heavier-than-air flight was possible. He attempted to scale up the design for someone to actually fly in it, but it didn't go so well. The plane crashed on takeoff and happened again on its second flight two months later. The plane had bad aerodynamics and was built too weak, which were problems Samuel did not know how to fix. Langley crashed out and gave up on his plane design, working at the Smithsonian Museum after. Then two brothers were inspired by flight when they saw a rubber propelling toy that could fly like a helicopter. They thought if it would be possible to fly like that in real life. So time passed by and they earned a living by forming a successful bicycle business in 1892. They began to learn to build their own bikes they sold, and used that knowledge to build their own planes. So remember Otto Lienthal and Samuel Langley? These people were heavy inspirations to the Wright brothers, and used their knowledge to construct their own flying machine. So first they started with kite experiments. They needed feedback on how the plane could fly. So they built a wind tunnel which was a wooden box and a fan that would blow wind inside to test the aerodynamics of the kites. So then they thought, where could we find a place that's windy like the wind tunnel to test an actual plane? That's when they looked and found the perfect plane where it was always windy, North Carolina Kitty Hawk. This was the place they tested their full-sized prototypes tethered to the ground at the windy area. They had to solve three main problems to actually fly though. First was getting off the ground. They fixed this with using propellers and the aerodynamic design of their plane. These propellers were not like any other propellers on the market though. They made unique aerodynamics propellers that could actually fly. The second problem was having the power to move forward, which they made a completely custom-built aluminum engine with the help of a friend. It was custom because no other engine was powerful and light enough. Alright, they got lift, they got power, what else? Oh, actually steering the plane. So they controlled all three possible directions a plane could steer using an elevator, a rudder, and a wing twisting contraption, all conveniently described with my animation. This was tested and discovered in their wind tunnel. Then the Wright Flyer was born, and it became the first airplane in history to actually fly in 1903 by solving all of these problems. On December 17th, it glided to 120 feet in 12 seconds at Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. Then two years later, the plane could fly for 39 minutes, being able to maneuver in any direction. The Wright brothers later patented their designs and kept improving the structure of their planes. Around this time, other people in the world were trying to fly too. A man named Alberto Santos Dumont was one of those people and he flew using a Minecraft looking plane in front of a crowd in France. See, the Wright brothers didn't want people to know how they built their planes, so they couldn't steal it. Alberto, however, didn't care as much. It was the first powered flight in Europe that people saw happen. The Wright brothers needed a rail to launch their plane, however, his plane didn't, and flew about 197 feet through the air. The flight was around 21 seconds and it traveled 15 feet above the ground, but it was proof that humans really could fly. At this point, the Wright brothers were still low-key about their flying invention, so this was a huge deal in Europe. So people could finally fly now. But when did people start to use it for transportation? In 1914, a man named Percival E. Fanzler was an electrical engineer and the organizer of the first airliner called St. Petersburg Tampa Airboat Line. He gathered investors to help financially back his airline company with $3,300, which in 2025 inflation adjusted money is $105,000. The first flights were short, only around 20 minutes long, but it was much faster compared to boats and trains at the time. The cost for a ticket was $5, which adjusted for inflation was around $115. This was actually pretty generous as it was barely making profit from the price. He did this because he wanted to make sure more people were able to fly on his airline. Now at what point could we fly even higher than the skies, like into space? So before people were sent to space, there were satellites. The way these satellites were launched above the earth was using rockets. Why not use planes instead of rockets? Well, there's a reason they're called airplanes, they use air to fly, and in space there is no air to push off of. Before sending actual people to space, they sent animals like dogs or monkeys, but you might have not known that the first living thing to go to space were fruit flies. When they came back to Earth, they were horrifically dismantled and developed 23 types of cancers. No, I'm just kidding. They came back just fine. The first spacecraft to carry a person was called the Vostok 1. A man named Yuri Gigerin from the Soviet Union became the first human in space in recorded history in 1961. He rode inside a small spacecraft that he could only fit. It launched him into orbit using rockets on April 12th and made one full trip around the Earth in about 90 minutes. Gigerin was celebrated as a global hero for being the first man to reach space. 
In 1969, two astronauts, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, flew farther from Earth than anyone ever had before. They were aboard Apollo 11, the first spacecraft to successfully land people on the moon. They made history by landing and stepping onto the moon's surface. Once again, I'm honored to be in a time where there's the option to travel around the globe without having to endure weeks to even months of traveling. I hope you learned something new from this animation today, and I really appreciate the technology we have after spending hours of research on this video. Check out my store, JustJams.store, to grab the shirt I'm wearing, and have a great rest of your day. Peace.